Hey everybody, welcome back to Manga Mondays, the only manga review show that's doing something completely different today and uh, reviewing two manga at the same time. Because lately I've been picking up a lot of these like random single volume stories that I don't end up having enough to say about to complete a whole video, but I think are interesting enough to note. Um, although one of them, Bloodlust Vampire, I've actually owned for a long time, but uh, only read recently. So first I'm going to talk about King of Wolves. Just picked this up the other day, um, pretty much exclusively because of the two names on it. Buronson and Kentaro Miura. Buronson having been the writer of Fist of the North Star, and Kentaro Miura being the artist of Berserk. I had never heard of this. I didn't know the two of them worked together. This came out like slightly before Berserk. It's just a single volume story. They actually did a sequel, but it's never been translated. Um... And, uh, it's kinda cool. It's about, um, it's, I mean, it's basically a hyper-masculine action series about a dude with a huge sword, um, carving his way through Mongols, in this case. But the plot is that, uh, the, our main character is a Kengo champion and, like, an archaeologist or a history professor or some shit. He, he does history and Kengo. It kind of blitzes through the, like, the backstory of uh, the character in the early part of this. He's got a really hot girlfriend who he bangs in, like, the first ten pages, which is pretty awesome, quite honestly. Uh, Kentaro Miura can draw some really beautiful women and some really sweet love scenes. I mean, if you've read Berserk... You know that the scene, like, in spite of the sheer amount of rape in Berserk, when Guts and Casca actually have their, like, sentimental love scene, it's quite beautiful. And uh, there's a scene like that in the early part of this, um, with this extremely cute girl, um, who I like a lot. Anyway, so th this is a very much a, like, sex and violence, masculine kind of manga, but, um, but it's not, it's not like overblown it's not quite the level of berserk of like guts and gore you know it's a little bit more subdued than berserk um but basically the main character is studying the silk road and he disappears on the silk road and his girlfriend goes to go look for him she finds a pendant that she had given him somewhere out there and then she gets sucked into a giant vortex in the sky and it sends her back in time to the Mongol Empire. Uh, she's immediately captured by, like, some of Genghis Khan's army men. And they're going to rape her. They prepare to. Um, she gets her shirt torn off and shit. But she does not manage to get raped. I, I will note this fact. <laughs> there is no rape in this book. Only attempted rape. But the girl, um... She is, you know, she's like, well, obviously my dude probably got, like, sent here or whatever, or I don't know what happened, but I, I'm, you know, she's basically fucked. She's trapped. But um, the the guy who wants to rape her is, like, uh, you know, recognizing how strong-willed he is and wanting to get her to, like, want him, he takes her out to a gladiatorial arena. and He's like, I'm going to make you watch all these, like, slaves kill each other. And, of course, her boyfriend, Kengo Boy, is one of the gladiators, and uh, he's been fighting all these people, but he won't kill anybody because he has modern morals and, and doesn't believe in killing. He uses a katana that I guess he just happened to have on him when he got teleported back. He has, like, a massive katana, like, you know, not quite guts-level sword, but it's fucking huge. So, uh, let me see if I can find a picture of his fucking huge-ass sword. Um... Yeah, hold on. Here we go. The big splash cover page. Gigantic fuck-off katana. Um, so he he's there and he's fighting all these dudes. And, like, basically they spot each other. And they're both trying to figure out how they're going to get out of this situation. But, uh, you know, the main guy is such a great warrior that he kind of starts getting recruited by Genghis Khan. And the there's a bunch of plot twists abound from that point forward. The biggest, most important plot twist that I'm going to reveal because it happens about halfway through the book and I don't think... I think it's the main point of interest of this book because otherwise it's just a bunch of dudes fighting each other and, like, you know, a pretty standard, like, um... 
not revenge story, I guess a get back home story, fight your way back home kind of story. Um, the most interesting plot twist is that Genghis Khan is actually Japanese because there's this, let me look up what the name is. Like basically there was this, um, infamous warrior from Japan who went missing, um, Benkei Mus Mushashi Mushashibo, Benkei Musashibo, uh, who was apparently, um, he's a, he's a popular figure of Japanese folklore, and according to legend, he disappeared in, like, a, a time frame that, w like, is right before Genghis Khan started his rule. So basically, the, the concept of this book is that this famous Japanese folklore character, um, fled Japan or was led away from Japan with his right-hand man at one point and became Genghis Khan and took over, uh, you know, everything. So, you know, this is one of these... There's I almost want to consider this a genre of Japan writing stories where they retroactively take credit for every major historical event because there's a lot of anime and manga that do this where, like... Uh, for instance, Therma Roma, which is doing it comedically, but it's where Rome's bathhouses were, via time travel, actually inspired by Japan's bathhouses. Um, this is similar. But, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty fun story. It's very simplistic, very straightforward. It's, you know, got gorgeous Kentaro Miura art. Um, and I would even say that, like, it's structured better than Berserk usually is because Berserk kind of just like unfolds at its own pace over the course of as many volumes as it fucking wants. Um, Kentaro Miura is definitely more of a visualist than he is a storyteller in spite of the fact that he has told some incredible stories with Berserk, but never at, in like a tight way. Like Berserk has never been tight. It's uh, just had lots of interesting ideas. Um, this story is much more tightly constructed, but the ideas are not that interesting. There is a, a plot twist at the end that I was able to guess, because when I was about 70% of the way through this, I found out it had a sequel, and as soon as I knew that, I immediately guessed the ending, um, and was correct. But yeah, it's, uh, I mean, if you like this kind of thing, if you like historical warriors, if you like Genghis Khan, if you like... Uh, the Ben K guy, or like th just the idea of this goofy ass history rewrite, um, and also like cool samurai dudes fighting each other. This might be worth picking up. It's not super brutal. Like there's definitely a lot of violence, but it's not like there's not a lot of blood spray and gore the way that there is in Berserk usually. Um, so yeah, mostly worthwhile just to you know, acknowledge the collaboration of those two artists and see Kentaro Miura at an early stage in his career, back when he was more about doing hyper-masculine badass shit. Um, so anyway, the other book is Blood the Last Vampire, which is also a book I put, picked up mostly because of who wrote it, Benkyo Tamaoki. Benkyo Tamaoki created one of my favorite manga of all time, which is, uh... Uh, Tokyo Akazuki. Tokyo Akazuki is the most fucked up thing that's ever been made. It's about Little Red Riding Hood, who's this little lolly girl who wants Mr. Wolf to come eat her. So she fucks tons of random dudes, and if any of them isn't Mr. Wolf, she violently murders them. Um, with her immortal crazy body that can do anything like she can she can like open her body in half and eat people it's like the most weird trippy gory violent sexual fucked up thing ever with this really cool art style that draws dark circles under everybody's eyes which the few of you who have actually seen um, my art will know that that's how I draw as well um so I've been a fan of Tamaoki Benko ever since reading Tokyo Kazuki, which, by the way, the, the actual plot of that manga, totally incomprehensible, but it's really fun. And um, other than that, he's mostly done erotic art. He's done, like, all kinds of porn, often fetish stuff, um, and apparently some of it's been brought to America, according to the blurb in this, but, like, 
he's you know he's he's known as an erotic artist and for drawing trippy weird shit. But back in two thousand two, he did a manga for Blood the Last Vampire. Not long after the original film. Now, Blood the Last Vampire was one of my first anime. Um, so I kind of have a soft spot for it in spite of the fact that it's a franchise whose existence I don't understand at all. Because no one entry in it is either particularly popular or particularly good. They're all kind of mediocre. But somehow there's a shitload of it. And I don't really get why. And this is no different. Um, while I love Tamaoki Benkyo's style in general, like, I love... Images like this, where he draws these, like, Saya as just this very, like, uh, you know, tired-looking, angry girl who uh, beats people up. And there's also lots of nudity and um, sexual violence in this manga, which is all pr pretty cool, honestly. <laughs> and uh, it, it's it's horror-themed. It's about, like, vampires and, and like it definitely plays up the sexual element of vampires quite a bit. There's almost not much I can show you out of this because there's so many tits. Like, the villain is almost exclusively shown naked. Here we go. Here's a great picture. Like, here's where the artwork looks fantastic when he's just doing, like, a one-off page of Saya looking really nice. However, most of the artwork is janky as fuck. Like, just on average, like... The characters kind of look like shit, and the movement uh, always looks like shit, you know? Um, it's just a weirdly inconsistent uh, manga. Like, most of it looks bad, and occasionally it looks okay. And, like, as much as I love the character designs and the general art style, like, most of it looks bad. And it also takes a long time to pick up, and a lot of the dialogue is really weirdly stilted. And I almost thought it was the translation, just because it was so consistently bad. But then, like, the last couple chapters make way more sense. And, like, Tamoki Benkyo's uh, dialogue has, is stilted in the other shit I've read from him as well. Like, he's not very good at, like, making a coherent narrative in the dialogue. Um, there's just, like, lots of weird phrasing he chooses. Or, like, phrasing that, that is more image-based than informative, almost. Like, I don't know how to describe it, but it feels weird. Um, and the story of this is a pretty fucking straightforward horror story. You've got this teenage girl who's dissatisfied with her life, or her parent, everyone rags on her. Like, basically everyone at school, everyone in her family, they all shit on her incessantly, and she's got rumors about her all the time, and she just basically wants to escape. And there's this beautiful girl who she's in love with and wants to take her away. Um, that girl, of course, being a vampire who's leading a, a gang of Corrupterans, which are, the, like, the, the demon vampire things that, that Saya fights. Um, and she's just basically using this girl and everyone else to, to kill people and gain more food. Meanwhile, Saya, who is the vampire slayer, is ha having a very contentious relationship with her handlers and the government people she works with. Um, which is kind of an interesting take I've never seen in another iteration of Blood. Like, in the movie, it's, she's just a warrior. Like, she just works for them and kills Corrupterans. In this, uh, they treat her pretty shittily, and she kind of seems to want no part in it, and is, like, almost deliberately doing her job badly because she's sick of working for these people. Um, which all comes to head in the final chapter, which is the only part that is actually in any way interesting, because Saya and... The villain are, like, they're basically identical, and apparently they're both, like, they're both, like, clones from the same DNA of an original vampire, and the the other one tells Saya to eat her so they can become one mind, and she does, and leaves the government. So, like, this ends with her, like, on the run as a psychotic vampire, um, which is a cool way of ending it, but, like, I, I spoiled that for you because this is not worth reading, um, even if you generally like Bloodlust Vampire and Tamaoki Benkyo, like, th there's, there's some action scenes that are kind of okay, and some edgy moments, there's some lesbian sex, um, with lots of biting, there's some gore, but, like, all of it's just okay at best, there's nothing in here that's gonna, like, be a huge draw if you're a fan of, like, the genres or anything like that. Like, again, the only thing I really thought was at all interesting was alternate Saya asking Saya to eat her and become a hive mind with her. And, you know, I like 
I like this brand of edgy, violent shit. I generally like vampires when they're portrayed in more of an edgy, sexual, violent way. Um, but still, it's not that interesting. It, it's as good as, like, most of the Blood franchise, which is to say, not very. Um, like, I'd say Blood Plus is probably the best version, and even that's, like, a 50-episode show that could have been 26 episodes easily. Uh, and it, I think that Blood Plus takes some inspiration from this like the way that Saya and the other girl are handled is kind of done in that show as well but like I don't know anyway do I recommend either of these like blood uh, only if you're like like me weirdly invested in the franchise which I don't know anyone else who is like I have a a strange fascination with it just because it was one of my first anime like you know over 15 years ago and um and I bought this because it was Tamaoki Benkyo. Like, it's worth it to own it for me just because none of his other shit's available in English. If Tokyo Akazukin was, I'd buy that. But, you know, I got this instead. Uh, this one, I would say, you know, all the stuff I said about it already. Like, if you like the, the genres I specified, check it out. Or if you're just a huge Kentaro Miura fan, you want to see everything he's done. But, um... Neither one is a, star, a sterling recommendation, which is why I threw them both into one video, and I might do this with the next video too, because I have a couple more random weird one-offs that I've bought. So, stay tuned for that, I'll see you next week.